at the Battle of El Paso slash Fort Bliss, within the entire region in just the first hour alone, many different occurrences were unfolding all throughout the battlefield as the external components, primarily comprised of the PLA's 14th Group Army and PAP's 18th Light Armor Brigade, were battering their way across the border all throughout the battlefield. The Trojan elements comprised here of the Pakistani Army's 14th Infantry Division were likewise racing off of their CCP regime properties, which were CHICOM properties from which not just CHICOM forces, but their allies were based. And the Trojan elements were organized and supplied as well as based at these properties for the day when the invasion occurred, such as was occurring now. On the first day of the four-day-long invasion, this just being within the first hour alone. As in the South, in the previous video of this sub-series of the whole documentary, the Combat Engineer Battalion, along with one of the multiple mechanized infantry battalions within the 14th Infantry Division, had broken out of their CCP regime properties and made straight for the main post, which itself was largely occupied by the 1st Armored Division's 2nd Armored Brigade at this point in the conflict this early on as many units were already armed and properly equipped as per the Redcon status of this active duty army installation, including the forces of the 1st Armored Division, its subcomponents, its brigades that were still here on the post and not either deployed overseas or deployed to far-flung parts of the USA, either on training or full-on deployments, such as the two different THAAD batteries, one of which was deployed to Alaska, while the other was deployed to the Middle East, leaving only one THAAD battery of the 11th Air Defense Artillery Brigade, a separate unit from the 1st Armored Division, as well as the 1st Armored Division's entire Combat Aviation Brigade, being deployed to Europe, leaving only a small rear detachment of non-deployable troops led by an O3 or a captain and an E8 or a first sergeant picked to supervise the remaining troops on the installation. However, at the opening of hostilities with the enormous artillery and missile barrage, many of these additional forces in addition to the forces that were fully armed by this point and equipped in either training with live fire training with live ammunition or having had finished their pre-maintenance services and checks on all their vehicles before rolling out to participate in battalion level drills. Similar to the snap drills often held by Russia that were done to see and test the readiness of different units as it related to live combat situations. Such was occurring due to the heightened international tensions with both Russia and China vis-a-vis -vis the USA, as well as the allies of Russia and China largely, as the Sino-Russian naval drills that had been held off the both American coasts before the invasion began were a large reason for the types of readiness postures now being taken, albeit far too late, by American forces. At the encounter occurring between one of the two armored battalions of the 14th Pakistani Infantry Division, as well as a an additional mechanized infantry battalion, occurring at the Biggs Army Airfield, where they had smashed their way in, they were being faced by an armored battalion of the 2nd 
Brigade of the 1st Armored Division, namely the 1st of the 35th, who at this particular map had three of its subordinate armored companies present, as well as a company from the 5th Armored Brigade, a whole separate unit that was essentially a training brigade, which was comprised of both active and reserve components, with it, uh, comprising the larger 5th Armored Brigade as a whole, whose 1st of the th 360th Infantry Regiment, <clears throat> or 1st Battalion of the 360th, was to begin training along with the 1st Armored Division's remaining forces that were not at Fort Sill on training operations, essentially it's artillery brigade and also the sustainment brigade of the 1st Armored Division, which were at Fort Sill training at the time of the invasion. As the 11th Air Defense Artillery was already largely set up within the training areas with its various Patriot missile battalions and one of its three THAAD batteries still left at the installation, the 1st of the 360th Infantry Regiment, part of the larger 5th Armored Brigade, this training unit, was to begin training on live fire training with one of its subordinate companies comprising the first of the 360th to set out to conduct live fire training with AT4s or essentially an anti-tank man portable shoulder fired recoilless shell system. And they were also, as per the Redcon status, already having had signed out their weapons and live ammunition for their personal weapons, had already left their part of the main post to conduct the training exercises, although at the time of the invasion, having lost communications due to the electronic warfare, as well as the loss of their military networks due to the massive cyber hack from China, as well as the anti-satellite strikes from both China and Russia, these forces were in a state of confusion upon instantly having lost all of their comms, navigation, and other networks, and thereby stopped in the middle of the post upon the initial missile strikes from three different nations, namely China, Iran, and Russia, who had all launched a massive array of different types of crews and tactical ballistic missiles at the installation. As even 30 minutes in to the whole invasion, including the battle in the Fort Bliss El Paso subregion, missiles were still coming in in fairly large numbers as indicated in just this mere little one by one and a half mile portion of the installation here, just north of the main post where the previous video had shown a lot of the combat occurring there. The Biggs Army Airfield portion of the post, which was adjacent to both the main post just slightly south as well as to East Fort Bliss, which was just to the east, was under heavy attack. And much of these rear detachment forces are essentially a company-sized element of ad hoc, uh, of an ad hoc company of rear detachment with, again, a captain and first sergeant over it, were largely destroyed within these cruise and ballistic missile strikes. Although the main portion of the combat aviation brigade of the 1st Armored Division were, again, deployed overseas in Europe at the time of the invasion. As DH-10A Chinese subsonic cruise missiles flew in along with CH-901A loitering munitions and even a pair of Russian MiG-31 
K strike aircraft were giving air support to these local Pakistani forces and a Chinese WZ-8 high-altitude stealth recon drone relaying coordinates and steady intel on the positioning of American forces in the area and relaying that back to the Pakistani allies of these two different battalions with mainly the armored battalion leading the assault with the mechanized infantry battalion following on behind as the armored battalion had its own armored infantry forces with it this being a primarily track oriented battalion as by track that indicates tracked vehicles as the armored or tank companies were comprised of the Al-Khalid main battle tanks, cruise missile flying in to hit their target, the Al-Khalid main battle tanks, which assaulted the base in various areas as there were two subordinate armored battalions comprising a part of the 14th Infantry Division of the Pakistani Army. These forces battered their way into the installation along with their armored infantry who were comprised of Viper infantry fighting vehicles as well as Sa'ad or essentially M113 clones of armor personnel carriers or sometimes M113s themselves as there were ample numbers of these having been purchased throughout the Cold War as there was a local arms race through much of the Cold War between Pakistan and India, and ample numbers of these vehicles were purchased. There was a spearheading tank company on this particular battle map here, and there was an armored infantry company, as indicated by this platoon here, this platoon here, and this platoon here. The tank platoons were here, 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 and here of the tank company spearheading the assault with one company of its armored infantry. As there were more companies coming into the area, as indicated by this arrow here, which was a whole mechanized infantry company, and there was a, another tank company, as indicated by this arrow, and there was even another tank platoon from another tank company, as indicated by this arrow, coming in here. As these forces moved into position, as this was now, at this point, some 30 minutes into the invasion and into the battle itself, the forces of Americans, the local forces in the area, again, three heavy companies or tank companies from the 1st of the 35th Armored Regiment, which itself, the 1st of the 135th, which was a battalion, belonged to the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Armored Division. As also were these LMTV trucks, which dropped off their company, their subordinate company of the 5th Armored Brigade's 1st of the 360th Infantry Regiment, which itself, the 1st of the 360th, was a subunit, a battalion, comprising part of the 5th Armored Brigade, a separate unit from the 1st armored division and its subordinate brigades. These forces were essentially now acting as foot infantry throughout this battle as they all had disembarked from their LMTVs and were running across the now completely cratered airfield area, which was ordinarily home to the different battalions that comprised the 1st Armored Division's Combat Aviation Brigade, including its 3rd Squadron of the 6th Cavalry Regiment, which was 
a heavy air cav type of element, which was a battalion sized unit, but it was called a squadron as a cavalry term for a battalion. There was also the 1st Battalion of the 501st Aviation Regiment, the 2nd Battalion of the 501st Aviation Regiment, 3rd Battalion of the 501st Aviation Regiment, and the 127th Aviation Support Battalion. And also there was even a independent company, which was a reconnaissance company, which was E Company of the 501st Aviation Regiment. These Forces were all deployed overseas in Europe, leaving only their rear detachment of all the troops from all these subordinate battalions, which couldn't deploy with the rest of the unit, which were under the command of a captain and first sergeant as the lead officer and NCO, respectively. These forces, again, had been largely decimated in the opening missile barrage, not to mention all the artillery strikes just slightly further to the south, hitting the main post. As more and more cruise missiles and tactical ballistic missiles came in to strike their targets, a Shahab 2 here, as well as two DF 15Bs, the Pakistani forces rushed deep into the installation, having smashed the outer fencing a bit further off the map and were now moving into areas that had been recently struck by artillery as well as missile strikes as you can see the totally rubble piled buildings that were once buildings on the edges of these missile strikes here as well as long range artillery shell strikes that hit the buildings themselves with precision strikes, as well as more missile strikes that hit portions of the airfield itself, as well as areas off the airfield that were normally hangars and pads for the helos of the now deployed Combat Aviation Brigade of the 1st Armored Division. Like this entire area right here, completely saturated by missile strikes as you can see, all the craters, which normally be areas where there were helos, as well as maintenance areas and others. This building is, for now, intact here by the end of this runway. As there were also drones, besides just helos, that were operated by this aviation brigade, not to mention the runway could also accommodate certain types of aircraft as well, such as the civil aviation that would often fly troops overseas for their deployments, being one type of aircraft accommodated. As this battle was well underway 30 minutes in, and these troops now, due to the loss of communications and the complete and total saturation by missiles and artillery strikes of the installation, had stopped and disembarked from their LMTV trucks, not counting this headquarters platoon of one of the three armored companies in the area, this one moving into the area as is this one over here moving into the area. This one that was already here at the airfield was what this platoon was a part of with the two command tanks for the 03 and first sergeant respectively of the forces present. And these being the three combat platoons of this particular heavy company here, or tank company. And as you can see, many of these tanks are already being engaged by CH-901A loitering munitions, even Russian KH-58 anti-radiation missiles, which can even go for radio sets and, and can home in on those, which all vehicles have, and strike those as they emanate radio signals 
and can be fired upon by anti-radiation missiles besides just radars. As well as this one coming in and strafing with its nose cannons, hitting this column from this heavy company now moving into the area, it's indicated by the blue. There's also red as this CH-901A is hitting the tanks that weren't already destroyed in this side of the column by these three CH-901As flying in and hitting this tank, this tank, and this tank. These tanks are already being fired on by Pakistani forces of their armored infantry forces as well as their tank forces, these tank platoons of this tank company spearheading the attack itself. These being the Al-Khalid main battle tanks with their large 125 millimeter main guns, which had quite a range to them, just like the American M1A2s had quite a range to them. And this was a largely a tank-on-tank -tank battle, although there was an infantry component to it as well, as the armored infantry dismounts were now moving into place to combat either the armor forces or the American dismounted forces acting as an infantry force in this particular battle with their AT-4 anti-armor weapons. While a mortar company belonging to the other battalion of the Pakistani forces in the area, the mechanized infantry battalion had dropped off their mortar teams to fire from two miles outside of the installation with their 81 millimeter mortars fired from their LLR-81 French made 81 millimeter mortars, which were splashing the area behind the tank forces here and eliminating many of the infantry forces of the Americans as indicated. You have five eliminated here, one here, one here, this one being engaged by the outer blast radius. These guys being engaged by the outer blast radius of this, this, this. Of course, you have Chinese artillery strikes that were, that are in, in, imminently inbound here, 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 here. Hitting this entire platoon, the headquarters platoon of the, of the armored company that was deployed right here along the runway, they had, having had already moved up and into position upon having gotten into their vehicles upon doing their pre-maintenance services and checks and departed to carry out a battalion-level drill in the training areas as part of their Redcon status. As, these, as this company of the 5th Armored Brigade's 1st of the 360th Infantry Regiment was likewise moving out to conduct training with live fire training with their AT4 anti anti armor anti tank systems these were portable shoulder fired non guided you know these were fire and forget weapons as they were a recoilless shell an 84 millimeter shell fired from a tube that was disposable upon having used the weapon the alcatan systems that were purchased from Spain in decent quantities by the Pakistanis were a bit larger than the 84 millimeter shells fired by the AT4s. They were 100 millimeter and they were tandem charged heat, heat warheads and could destroy 700 millimeters of RHA while the AT4 could destroy 400 millimeters of RHA with the Akatan being far more powerful as far as the capabilities of destroying armor uh, as it as it's measured by the RHA measurement. So with the additional 300 millimeters of RHA punch that the Alcatan had, the the AT4 still still being a fairly potent anti-armor weapon couldn't do much to main battle tanks that had either a pleak armor or uh, ERA kits put upon them like these Al-Khalid main battle tanks had. You know, it would take, it'd take several well-fired AT-4s to really do much to one of these tanks unless you're hitting them from the rear or maybe certain 
angles as it related to the top of the tank as far as climbing on top of a building or a rubble pile and firing down on top of a tank, sort of like in the last battle how some of the hunter-killer teams were able to get within 50 meters of the main battle tank and climb atop a rubble pile and fire their AT weapons at the tops of the M1, A2 tanks, being able to penetrate that part because the roofs of the tanks are nowhere near as strong. The roof in the backs of a tank is nowhere near as strong as the front or even the sides. That's typically a standard as it applies to most main battle tanks around the world. These MiG 31K strike aircraft, as these, these were essentially a version of the MiG 31 fighter that were mainly oriented with ground strike. They were armed with air to ground missiles and munitions. This pair providing close air support for the Pakistani forces operating in the area, this being a one and a half by one mile area as opposed to a one kilometer area like in the last map north to south. This is a large area here, this being the whole Biggs Army airfield area. This was very large. There was even more of the installation to the northwest of this particular area where they had smashed in through the fence, but largely a lot of that area wasn't inhabited with very many buildings, although there were American forces out on the perimeter on guard duty as per Redcon status, but they were quickly dispatched and dealt with in the opening minutes of the breaching of the outer perimeter of the installation. Not to mention the heavy artillery strikes and missile strikes in the area, most of the artillery being it's just to the south, slightly off the map at the main post, although there were some strikes directly on buildings in this area that weren't completely leveled by being directly in the missile strike or in the immediate periphery of them. Here you have a CH-901A destroying this, this one lead tank. This other lead tank's being engaged by fire from Pakistanis, as is this one, this one, this one, and this one. You have, you have the Pakistani tanks firing their fairly long-range 125mm guns at these tanks, hitting and destroying this M1A2 right here, but the M1A2s are fighting back, and they do destroy two Pakistan while engaging other ones, as well as having destroyed a few of their APCs and a Viper IFV in this particular battle. These four in combat, and although the forces had lost their GPS on the American side, their communications, and their military networks in general as part of their communications, like their networks similar to like the Blue Force Tracker and, and newer iterations of such designs that they had at this point, they were still fighting their very best, and their tanks were still able to fire at anything they could see on the battlefield. And although there were rubble buildings that sometimes blocked their view as far as their optics in the tanks, the tanks still managed to get in a few very good hits with their 120mm fairly long-range main gun and the 120mm rifle tank guns used by the Abrams tanks, these M1A2s, were very potent tank-busting guns, and they could do the job just like the 125mm, slightly larger, main guns used by the Pakistani, Chinese, and Russian tanks. The 120 having definitely proved itself already in combat many times. There were still tactical ballistic missiles coming in, which struck the area. Again, two of these are DF-15Bs and one being a Shahab-2 here, as well as other Shahab and DF missile strikes as related to the different DF type of ballistic and even cruise missiles like the DF-100, which mostly, most of the 100s considered uh, were, were fired further north and 
hit the elements of the 11th Air Defense Artillery Brigade as those were hypersonic cruise missiles and they weren't to be wasted on smaller targets, which generally were fired at by subsonic cruise missiles as well as some supersonic cruise missiles that broke the sound barrier as well as, but weren't hypersonic, as well as the tactical ballistic missiles, which could be fired at more, more liberally at certain other targets such as the buildings on this airfield and around it. Of course, there were also the artillery strikes. And at this battle, these CH-901As con continued to strike targets like this M88 armored recovery vehicle, this command tank, this M1 Abrams here, as well as this Max Pro MRAP right here as part of this headquarters platoon element. And the combination of heavy artillery saturation and this other CH-901A destroyed all the LMTVs. There's a strike there, here, 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 as well as around this platoon. These heavy strikes that came in immediately as this battle was unfolding decimated large numbers of vehicles and dismounted troops, although some of the dismounted troops, while being engaged and many being eliminated, continued on to the airfield while being engaged by the dismounted Pakistani armored infantry troops, while their tanks were being steadily destroyed by CH-901As and KH-58 anti-radiation missiles, like here and here, as well as being strafed by the potent nose cannon of the MiG-31K right here, as well as being engaged by other additional CH-901As here, 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 as well as up here by the time these tanks got here, and being fired upon by Concours anti-tank guided missiles from the Viper infantry fighting vehicles of the Pakistani armored infantry forces, as well as the main tank gun fire from the very potent tanks, the Al-Khalid main battle tanks of the armored forces. There's an ample number of different things going on. You had bounding and covering tactically with these two half squads here, five and five. You had this half a squad bounding, taking cover, firing, and then this squad bounding ahead, taking cover, firing over this large crater and then them bounding to the edge of the crater, taking cover and firing over it. As well as the mortar strikes, the, ar the artillery coming in and crashing, the CH-901A loitering munitions. It was totally savage. And although the Americans fired back and they had time to fire a few rounds before being totally destroyed by the heat, the heat warhead laden CH-901As, the anti-radiation KH-58 air-to-ground missiles from the MiGs, the strafing from the MiGs that hit the tops of these tanks and shredded into them and eliminated the crews, and the tank gun fire from the very potent Al-Khalid main battle tanks, and the Concours anti-tank guided missiles from the Viper IFVs, these forces did their absolute very best to fight back, but it was all over in a matter of minutes as this column, this whole armored company, which part of which was the, the headquarters platoon with its two command tanks and its support vehicles just being off the map rolling into the area, by the time they all got here, one platoon went this way of the main combat platoons of this tank company, another went this way and another went this way to begin to try to maneuver to engage the Pakistanis now moving into the area, although there was a tank platoon of, of Al-Khalid main battle tanks just off the map that were firing at them, along with the ballistic missiles already having hit by the, by the point of them reaching here. They had already hit and caused craters before they even got here and then split up. So there were craters here and all over here. And these guys had already been hit before these missiles even landed. They were already hit and destroyed by the Pakistani 
main battle tanks, their their Alkalids having had fired and destroyed this whole row, and they fired as well, and did destroy an Alkalid here, one here, and an, another Alkalid that was off the map, and then they also destroyed this APC, this APC, as well as a Viper infantry fighting vehicle, which was moving into the area here this from this platoon. These forces got one good volley of, of shells off before they were all hit and destroyed by the different artillery, by the CH-901As, the anti-radiation missiles fired by the MiGs, the strafing from this from this MiG here, the the artillery strikes from the Chinese that were that laid waste to this whole area up here, here, here. And the missiles by the time they came in, these had already just been destroyed by the tank fire from the Pakistanis by the time they hit the runway here and caused huge craters and hit here before these this whole column even moved up and the artillery then came in and splashed on top of the area to engage these tanks by the time they moved here and it did damage a few of them like in their sides and with the tracks and everything blew the tracks off and shell shocked the crews a bit but because they didn't directly hit the tanks they didn't they didn't completely eliminate the crew inside by either concussion or by getting a good hit that actually penetrated the top. So these forces were able to maneuver a bit before finally being destroyed by Pakistani tanks and infantry fighting vehicles firing their concourse ATGMs or anti-tank guided missiles, which the Viper possessed. The Viper also possessed a new combat module created by Slovakia called the the Terra combat module, which directed its 30 millimeter auto cannon and, and coax PKT machine gun, as well as its concourse ATGMs. So it was a very modernized, very new Pakistani built vehicle with some foreign components in it. Within their Taksala modernized by China heavy industries that built their vehicles. All of these LMTVs were totally gone by the Chinese artillery fire, along with these troops that stayed behind here, 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 and here. They were all wiped out, along with the CH-901s and more artillery here that destroyed this, this headquarters platoon, along with the artillery and the more up here, the mortars hitting a lot of these infantry bound troops with their AT-4s as they tried to get into position and fire against these dismounted Pakistani forces as they these two squads bounded and covered. This squad stayed here to provide fire along with this squad over these large missile craters here. And this squad bounded here, started opening fire by the time these forces got here. And then as they were opening fire, this squad bounded in position and opened fire, allowing this squad to bound in position and open fire for them to shift fire this way, along with these squads here that are now bounded and covered here behind this large missile crater. And we're in the prone position opening fire as these American forces were likewise in the prone position by this point, you know, trying to stay low, keep a low silhouette during the, the combat. This squad had already moved into position to also aid in these two half squads bounding and covering which this was like full squad but they were bounding as half as half squad elements while this platoon moved into position that lost its its IFV which was its viper IFV while this squad was here again firing on this on this group of american dismounts that had got to the end of the runway and they were taking cover alongside of the rubble in a prone position while this squad likewise moved to the road, somewhat covered by rubble. Although the AT-4 and small arms fire from the Americans was considerably heavy and did result 
in some Pakistani dismounted infantry casualties, although the casualties were still considerably light due to the fact the Americans were taking such heavy fire from the Mechanized Infantry Battalion's Mortar Company, which was not part of the Armored Infantry uh, Forces here, but they were off the map as they were part of a whole separate battalion. As this was the Armored Battalion and the Mechanized Infantry Battalion advancing in behind them. They fell in behind them and they were moving into the area behind these two lead companies of the Armored battalion that was attacking because there were other companies of the armored battalion like his headquarters company and more armored and and armored infantry troops of theirs as indicated by these two arrows these were two other companies of that battalion moving into the area down here this entire column really got hit hard by the ch 901a's the mig strafing the mig 31k and the uh, also the fire from the Pakistani IFVs and and tank fire as these tanks again had very long range guns and they were they were rushing into the installation to use the shock and awe of total surprise and speed to overwhelm the enemy which indeed they did I mean even though the Americans as per their Redcon status you know I, I give them advantages you know that in an ideal situation they'd have like being prepared with due, due to a redcon status or their readiness condition for the base they were armed they did manage to get to their firearms from the armory they did do their pre-maintenance services and checks and get their vehicles out as this was an ideal condition for the americans although in although in reality having all their communications destroyed with anti-satellite weapons and their the enemy electronic warfare of the invaders as well as the cyber attack would severely curtail their combat fighting abilities without ISR even under ideal conditions having made it to their vehicles and weapons they could only do so much and they put up a good fight but in the end were overwhelmed as this entire battle here is these mechanized infantry forces dismounts from there, like this platoon right here, moving into position, stacking behind rubble piles that used to be larger buildings, along with this double column formation, or I'm sorry, staggered column formation as they're staggered. And one here, one here, like a like a diagonal type thing. Like one here, one there, one there, one there, one there. Yeah, that's a staggered column formation. And then you have a double column formation. And as they're moving, they're being engaged by American fire from their tanks, you know, their coax and their turret gunners, even firing their 50 cals, their M250 cals. They lost a few troops here, too, although they fired their Alcatone uh, man-portable anti-tank rockets and did eliminate a few of the M1 Abrams from their side hits from that very potent anti-tank weapon system. Spanish made with a reusable ballistic computer sighting system that had a laser rangefinder, which was more advanced than anything you would find on a old old school RPG type system, or even on the AT4 e either. So these were very potent AT systems, like used in the last video, and also the fire from their a their APC gunners on their Sa'ad APCs or M113 clones essentially and their Viper IFVs. They also closed on their enemy not just to, I'm talking about the Pakistanis, they closed on their American enemies not only to do a shock and awe and surprise them with their speed and mobility but also to close to get better to get within a better firing range of their small arms and anti-tank systems especially up here where they were fighting other what was now dismounted infantry type of forces from the fifth armored brigades first of the 360th infantry regiment which was part of the fifth armored brigade a separate american unit from their 
First Armored Division and other units on the post. They were primarily a training unit, but they were now having to fight much like all the other units on the installation, fighting for their own very survival against this very rapid, very high-stakes invasion. Pakistani Trojans simply overwhelmed the Americans at the post, as the Americans weren't ready for what really hit them. As the armor and armored infantry smashed their way into the Biggs Army airfield and overwhelmed these American armored forces with the aid of ample numbers of CH-901A loitering munitions armed with their heat warheads. Russian air support in the form of a pair of MiG-31Ks from their larger MiG-31K squadron of 12 total aircraft, as well as missiles continuing to come in and strike the airfield in its area itself, cruise missiles here, four of them, DH-10As from the 612th and 613th Strategic Missile Forces Reinforced Brigades, which are reinforced by reserve battalions being called up and assigned to those active brigades with their active battalions firing the more newer and advanced missile systems while the reserve brigades fired older or more common systems whether cruise or tactical ballistic missiles. The overwhelming combination of having lost all their communications, their ISR capabilities, in tandem with being attacked so many different ways from so many different angles, from above and from the sides and from in front and from even behind them, they were just simply overwhelmed by the loitering munitions, the air support, the ground-fired systems, and also the artillery, mortars, fire, anti-tank guided missiles, 125 millimeter tank guns from the Al-Khalids, and more just simply overwhelmed them, all hitting them all at once. And the battle for Biggs Army Airfield was over nearly as soon as it began. This, this starting 30 minutes in, to the invasion as the Trojan battalions had to reach the airfield, smash through the outer perimeter gates of the forward up, or, or I'm sorry, of the installation, and then get to the Biggs Army airfield within it, and then start initiating contact with the American forces. That took 30 minutes for them to get from their CCP properties to the base perimeter and to this battle after having smashed their way in, leading to the fighting that you see here unfolding. And this fighting from 30 minutes into the entire invasion and this battle of the El Paso Fort Bliss area went from 30 minutes into the invasion to the first hour, so the, end, so the end of hour one. So this lasted only 30 total minutes from the time the contact initiated between these Pakistani Trojan forces with the Chai comms providing them with intelligence, as well as the Russians providing air support in this instance, with the Chinese also providing loitering munition and artillery support, while tactical ballistic missiles from Iran and China continued to strike, as well as Russian air-fired cruise missiles, KH-55s and KH-101s, that were 30 minutes into the entire invasion, still hitting their SEAD targets as the Americans were widely dispersed, and it took them approximately 30 minutes to hit everything of the 11th Air Defense Artillery Brigade just to the north into the training areas, which occurred concurrently to all the fighting going on elsewhere on the map, including here at Biggs Army Airfield, just to the south at the main post, as well as in El Paso itself against the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Armored Division, which was happening along I-10. This all happened concurrently from the smashing their way in with the CHICOM forces, the external components, as well as the helos providing support to the combat engineers and mechanized infantry battalion of the Pakistani 14th Infantry Division, as well as providing also support to their own forces of the 48th Infantry Division 
smashing their way in while firing at the flanks held by this American heavy battalion here, this tank battalion. All of this all unfolding concurrently, including even the fighting going on here at this little salient, this little bulge of the 1st Brigade of the, of the 1st Armored Division, as well as Biggs Army Airfield, which that was occurring right here at this time, as well as the PAP's movements, having already s defeated the border crossing areas and their paramilitary forces there, as well as armed civilians, as well as moving their artillery battalion moving in and setting up new firing positions, firing here and then firing here in support of their two prongs of the 18th Light Armor Brigade of the PAP moving in and clearing the flanks here in New Mexico. This all began within the first hour, as well as all the fighting occurring on the installation itself and within the city. All of this occurred within hour one going into hour number two. Ample things were going on all throughout the battlefield, all at roughly the same exact time, within hour one going into hour number two. So this, again, was a very short and heavy battle with so many missile strikes, artillery strikes, and the rushing of Trojan and external forces to their objectives and striking them hard did not permit very much in terms of response from the defenders as they were simply overwhelmed rapidly even though they were already at a heightened redcon status the tandem anti-satellite and cyber strikes combined with the rapidity and sheer strength of the invasion forces and their striking against them simply made it impossible for the defenders to get the upper hand anywhere. And they were just simply overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by numbers, overwhelmed by their lack of communications and ISR capabilities as those were curtailed immediately at midnight, as well as the electronic warfare doing their part to curtail redundant systems like radio and portable radars for like the air defense elements. It was just simply too much, too fast. And only in the first hour alone, the Trojans were battering their way into the installation and crushing every unit they encountered, along with the externals doing the same in the city itself against the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Armored Division. PAP crushing the border paramilitary forces at Columbus, also at the border crossing where Mexico, Texas, and New Mexico all came together, as well as other border areas where there were armed civilians. They battered their way in there. ISR superior, superiority on the side of the invaders, their missile superiority, their superiority in vehicle numbers and quality just was simply too much. Air power and more. In the next video, the battles that occurred with the salient and in the northern part of the post will be gone over next, likewise occurring in hour one going into hour two, followed by the special operations mission against an armed civilian militia that was better organized than the reactionary armed civilians that popped up elsewhere to capture a high-value target conducted by the Stalking Leopard Special Operations Battalion of the larger 14th Group Army. Along with the assistance of the Transportation Battalion, flying transportation helicopters from the 141st Aviation Regiment, which flew and picked up the Special Operations Battalion after the Spec Ops Battalion had ensured that the artillery strikes against the border post as well as one of its subordinate companies helping in neutralizing these paramilitary forces had been conducted, which was done extremely rapid. I mean, there wasn't even really much of a fight here. And then they were picked up and flown deeper inland to conduct their operation in the Rocky Mountains against this potential partisan element, this, this armed civilian militia.
while all the rest of this was occurring and unfolding and even wrapping up to an extent fairly rapidly. There was also a battle at Deming that unfolded as the PAP forces were reaching the ends of their flank clearing mission before becoming part of the larger external prong to head further north as they were to go to I-10, clear its flanks before proceeding and lining up with the rest of the entire 14th Group Army as a part of the invasion prong moving up New Mexico as the external component. More to follow on this sub-series of the invasion documentary hypotheticals in the next video.